As you're taking your Bibles and turning back to that portion of Scripture that we just read a few moments ago in Exodus chapter 12, uh, let me mention once again the insert that you have in your bulletin. On the front side, what's happening in Israel? And um, we are moving into the last days, folks, and so it's very important to keep up with what's happening in the land of promise. And so um, Friends of Israel, uh, which is a ministry that was actually begun as the Jewish ministry outreach of this church here. Uh, it's over in Belmar now. They put out a magazine called Israel My Glory. I encourage you to subscribe to that. Uh, I get that magazine every month or every other month. It's bi-monthly. And uh, it's very well worth subscribing to. But uh, some months back they put out where to find good information online. And many, many, many different websites where you can uh, go to find out rather than listening to the secular news media, where you can go to find out what's really happening in the land. I know that when I lived there for a year and saw things going on and knew what was actually happening and then came back to the States, I thought, the media here sure isn't telling us what really is going on over there. Because uh, I had just come back from there and discovered that nobody had the foggiest idea. So if you want to know what is really happening in the land, be sure to look up some of those websites there and do uh, subscribe to the magazine Israel My Glory. And then on the back side, uh, you have a picture of my brother. That's my brother Peter and uh, actor John Rhys Davies, uh, who plays in his film. Some of you are familiar with John Rhys Davies. He's a very famous actor who has played in many different films. He plays the part of the rabbi in uh, my brother's film. Forty years ago, uh, the film Return uh, of a Hiding Place came out. And uh, it's the story of Corey Ten Boom and uh, the hiding of Jews uh, in Holland during World War II. And how she and her sister Betsy and her father uh, hid them in a special room that was constructed, a little tiny narrow space, right at the very top of their house. And whenever uh, the Nazis would come looking for Jews, all the Jews that were hiding in our house would run upstairs, slide through a little panel in the bottom of a, a cabinet, and into this narrow walled space behind it. And they were never found. Although Corey and her sister and her father were arrested because the Nazis knew something was going on, but they couldn't find the Jews. And a uh, very exciting story. And a true story. The book, The Hiding Place, came out years ago, and uh, Corey Ten Boom had made trips around the United States uh, telling her story. She's with the Lord now. But that was 40 years ago when that film came out. My brother has put out another film dealing with the teenagers who were involved in rescuing the Jews. And that's what this little article here is about. This came out last week uh, in the American Family Association Journal. Um, full page article but it's been out now for three or four months it's you can get it from Christian book discount it was on the main page of their videos for uh, Christmas shoppers and so on and right now at CBD it is on sale normally it's over twenty dollars to buy the video right now you can get it and the original 40th anniversary edition of the hiding place both videos for 19.95, I think, is the price. So it's a great deal. I encourage you to, to buy it. But read the article there. Uh, Corey's niece actually was involved with that group of teenagers who rescued hundreds of Jews and, um, in fact, rescued an entire Jewish orphanage just minutes before the Nazis arrived to kill all the children. That's in the film. So I encourage you to... I'm not doing this for an advertisement. People, we are living in these days. We may be the next targets. The Jews are already in the devil's sights. Christians are next. What are you doing, not just what are you talking about? Would you rescue a Jew if it meant possibly giving your life? These were Christians who acted upon what they believed. So, take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, over to Exodus, 
chapter 12, where God tells Israel he's going to make them into a nation. He's going to fulfill the promises that he gave to Abraham when he cut the covenant with Abraham and said, your, your descendants are going to be in Egypt 400 years in bondage, and then I'm going to deliver them. I'm going to make them into a nation. And I've established with you an everlasting covenant. And I'm going to give you a land for an everlasting covenant. It belongs to you. Not to the Muslims. It belongs to Israel. Promises that God will keep. And he has brought the Jews back to their homeland. They're surrounded by their enemies. When they became a nation, they were outnumbered 400 to 1. The day they declared independence, they were attacked. They had the equivalent of one airplane, one armored car, and a bunch of zip guns made out of car antennas. And they won. There is a God in heaven. And he keeps his promises. Here we are, Exodus chapter 12, where God establishes the covenant. And God tells Israel, you'd better pay attention or you'll die. All the other plagues up to this point, plagues numbers one through nine, either had very little impact on the land of Goshen, very back there at the very beginning, or had absolutely no impact. Goshen was separated out from all the other Egyptians just by divine fiat. But in this plague, God says to them, you are also required to do something this time. And if you don't, you'll be just like the Egyptians. Your firstborn will be dead. So pay attention. Follow directions exactly, precisely, specifically. Just like I tell you, do it at precisely the right time. Because at midnight, I'm giving you from the time the sun goes down till midnight to get this done. Don't delay it. Don't procrastinate. Don't wait till the last minute. Don't show up late at the house. We can say don't show up late at church, too. But don't show up late at the house or you're dead meat. You see, this was a picture of Christ. And it doesn't matter whether you're an Egyptian or a Jew or an American. If you don't have the Passover lamb, you're dead meat. And so the land of Goshen was not accepted from this final plague that God himself said would be the final plague. Now, last week was payday, better late than never, and I want to add a few additional thoughts from our reading last week. So if you flip back to chapter 11 for just a moment, there are a couple of things that I wanted to cover that we didn't have time for, and we'll go over those. In verse 1 it says, The Lord said unto Moses, Yet I will bring one more plague. God determines the end from the beginning. The children of Israel at the beginning did not know how many plagues there were going to be. They just saw them keep coming, one right after another, getting worse in intensity, and each plague being a judgment on a different god of Egypt. But this is a plague that's going to judge all the gods of Egypt, and God says so in the text. Not one of the gods of Egypt or all of the gods of Egypt combined could stop this final plague, which would also take the life of Pharaoh's son, the one who was to be the next god of Egypt. They all could not protect him. You see, when pagan gods challenged the real god, the real God takes offense, and the real God always wins. You remember in the days of Isaiah the prophet, 800 BC, the Assyrians came down on the land of Judah. They'd conquered Israel already, the northern tribes. They came down against Judah. 
They surrounded the city. Hezekiah was king. The Assyrian general, whose name was Ravshaka, came and stood outside the walls of Jerusalem, and he happened to speak Hebrew. No doubt a brilliant man. He was the general of all of those who were attacking Jerusalem. And he cursed God. He said, where is your God? Don't believe in the God that Hezekiah tells you to trust in. Because think about all the gods of all the other nations. We've beat all of them. And we'll beat your God too. And Isaiah took that scroll and laid it before the Lord. And the uh, Lord says, you go into Hezekiah and you tell him, it's not going to happen. By the way he came, by that same way he returned. By the same way that he came, not only will he return, go back to his own land, but I'll kill him there too. He won't shoot an arrow into Jerusalem. He won't build a siege works against the walls. He won't break through the gates. He won't do any of the things that he said he's going to do. And that night the angel of the Lord, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, the messenger of Jehovah, went out and killed 186,000 Assyrians. And the Assyrian army retreated. And they went back to Assyria. Sennacherib went into worship in the temple of his god, Nisroch. And two of his own sons, Edram, Melech, and Sherezer, killed him while he was worshiping his own god. His own god couldn't protect him in the place of his own gods, worship in his own homeland. God takes offense to pagan gods who challenge the living God. And so God is saying the same thing is going to happen to Pharaoh. I am afraid that some of our leaders have challenged the living God. God takes offense at those who challenge him and he always does something about it. But the country also suffers. God determines the end from the beginning. The end of verse 1, it also says, He shall surely thrust you out hence altogether. Yes, he would thrust them out, but, you know, he had experienced some pretty painful things up to that point. I mean, he'd been subject to the boils. He'd been subject to the gnats. He'd been subject to the flies. He'd been subject to the hail. He'd been subject to uh, the fire running along the ground. He'd been subject to all of these things, and he hardened his heart. But things that affect us, which are painful, sometimes we can overcome. But when it affects our children, it's even harder to bear. Pharaoh was going to lose his son that night. Down in verse 3 it says, The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. They gave them all that gold and silver and so on. We talked about that last week. Only God can give us favor in the sight of the pagans who are around us. You're surrounded by pagans. You're surrounded by Egyptians. Only God can give us favor in their sight. But I've often wondered as I read this passage, how pleased were the Egyptians after the death of all of their firstborn. Up to this point, Moses is a very great man in Egypt. The people are held in honor because they can see there's the God in heaven who's doing all these things. They're willing to give them that money, almost as a bribe, don't let anything worse happen. And then after they give them the money, all of their firstborn are killed. Good lesson to learn. You cannot bribe God. I mentioned that as we took the offering this morning. You cannot bribe God to get into heaven. You cannot think that this is earning you points by dropping money into the offering plate. You have to come under the blood. 
the blood of the Lamb. As John the forerunner said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. It's by the blood of the everlasting covenant, according to the book of Hebrews, that we are saved. What we look at here in Passover is the picture in miniature of the eternal story of redemption purchased by the blood of Christ on Calvary's cross. It's very interesting. It says, Moses was great in the sight of the people. And you know, later on, we're going to discover as we go with the children of Israel out of Egypt across the Red Sea and into the wilderness that there's a mixed multitude with them. There are some Egyptians who said, we're out of here. You know, hey, it looks like their God is stronger than our God. And it may have cost us our firstborn. And it may have cost us some other things. But we're out of here because their God is with them and our God is not with us. But it's a mixed multitude. And we discover that that mixed multitude doesn't have genuine faith because later in the wilderness journeys we find the mixed multitude leading the children of Israel into sin. In every church there's a mixed multitude. There are those who are saved. There are those who have come under the blood. But there are those who are not saved who are there for other reasons. Perhaps they were raised in the church and so they just do it out of habit. Perhaps, and in some churches this is true, though I doubt it here, they're looking for business contacts. In other churches they're doing it because they want to appear righteous. And they know deep in their hearts that there is, there is something wrong, but they don't want to admit that they're sinners. But they want to think that they're good and good people go to church. There are other people who go because they're trying to please some other person. Oh, well, maybe trying to please a parent, might be trying to please a child, might be trying to please someone that they're interested in. Whatever the reason. But it's a mixed multitude. And throughout history, the church has been filled with mixed multitudes. And in many cases, during times of persecution, it is the mixed multitude that betray those who are true Christians. And then verse 4, And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt. We're still back in chapter 11. Haven't gotten to chapter 12 yet. This is things I didn't give you last week. About midnight will I go out in the midst of Egypt. Did you know that that also is a prophetic picture of what is given to us as a prophetic statement in Psalm 110 and then is fulfilled in the book of Revelation? Let me show you. Keep your finger there in Exodus and turn with me, if you will, over to Psalm 110. It's a very short psalm. It's only seven verses long but is one of the most important psalms dealing with the second coming of Christ. Psalm 110. This psalm is also quoted three times in the book of Hebrews concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. A psalm of David. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Quoted in the apostolic sermons in the book of Acts as referring to Jesus. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. It's speaking of Jesus ruling from Jerusalem. Zion is Jerusalem. Now verses 3 and following. Very interesting because we're moving toward these events. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. First phrase of verse 3. We could spend a lot of time on this. I wrote my baby thesis in seminary on this psalm. You have to write two theses when you're in seminary. You have to write one that proves you can write a thesis, and then you write your real thesis. 
And the first one they call the baby thesis. It doesn't have to be, you know, 200 pages long. It only has to be about 75 pages long. Um, but uh, this is the psalm that I chose to write on. And there's a lot in here. But I'm going to give you summary. Where it says, Thy people shall be willing. The word translated willing is the word for a free will offering. You know, in the Old Testament, there were certain mandatory offerings. And there were of many, many different kinds. And we'll not go through all of them. But there were different kinds of offerings for different holidays. There were offerings for sin. There were offerings for trespass. Uh, there were peace offerings and there were meal offerings and, oh, many, many different kinds of offerings. But one was called a free will offering or a voluntary offering. It's not a, it's not a promotion of the concept of free will. It's voluntary. It was not required. But it was an offering that was given because a heart had turned in love to God. And so they brought it freely above and beyond all of their other offerings. Here it says, Thy people shall be a free will offering. Now, when David writes about thy people, he's not talking about the church, he's talking about the Jews. But he gives a specific time as to when that is going to take place. Thy people shall be a freewill offering in the day of thy power. The word translated power is in the day of thy armies. Now, who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about Jesus coming back and sitting on his throne in Zion and ruling in the midst of his enemies and sending the rod of his strength out of Zion. This psalm is quoted multiple times in the New Testament, and they all say it refers to Jesus. I'm not making it up. So in the day of your armies, when are the day of Jesus' armies? If you know the book of Revelation, you know that's Revelation chapter 19, where Christ comes back, a blazing white stallion leading the armies of heaven against the Antichrist to deliver Jerusalem. It's on that day, Hosea 6, after the three days of repentance, that Israel turns to Christ as a nation and cries for his deliverance. And he comes as he promised. In the beauties of holiness. That word is the word that's used for the holy festival garments. The beautiful white linen garments that were worn at all the holy festivals in Jerusalem, the seven feasts of Israel. That's the word that David uses. In the days of thy army, in holy festival garments. And then... What ties us in with the Exodus here? The phrase, from the womb of the morning. Now, when we think of the morning, we think of sunrise. We think of, oh, the pink clouds and the sun coming up over the horizon and everything is bright and cheerful and birds are singing and all that kind of nice stuff. The word translated morning here is shahar. That's the word for utter, utter total blackness the void of any light. And it uses the term of a womb because Paul speaks of, of the whole creation is in travail. The pains of birth. That's what the earth is going through during the tribulation period. The birth pangs. Waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's the phraseology that Paul uses. There is a convulsing, convulsing in labor. From total darkness of the womb, from the shachar, the blackness of the night, do you understand that that is what the world will be like at the moment Christ returns, according to the book of Revelation? We'll see that in just a moment. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. There's going to be a restoration. Oh, there's so much in here, but I, I have to move through it quickly. Otherwise, we'll not get all the way through Exodus here. 
Verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That clearly refers to Christ. Three times in Hebrews chapter 6, the last verse all the way through chapter 7, we are told it refers to Christ. The Melchizedekian priesthood does not belong to the Mormons. It belongs to Jesus. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. That's what Christ does at the second coming. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. And then the victor, he shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. I wish we had time to talk about all that, but we don't this morning. But that brings us to the darkness. Revelation 16. At midnight, the darkest part of the night, is when the angel of death is going to come and pass over the land of Egypt. Revelation 16.10 And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. Uh, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. Now I want you to see what happens next. Look at verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up. Right after Passover, what do we have? The crossing of the Red Sea. God opens the way and dries the land for them. Do you see God giving some prophetic warnings? Out of the book of Exodus, where God makes Israel a nation, into the book of Revelation, where God finally delivers the Jews, and Christ establishes his millennial kingdom that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And then you have the three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, the false prophet. They're spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them into the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And you know what that's called? That's called Armageddon. Verse 16 tells you that. But that's like the battle between the magician, demon, God, false gods of Egypt with Pharaoh. There's a battle about to take place. The seventh angel poured out his vial, verse 17, and there came a voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. Just like God said, there is just one more plague. And you've got lightnings and thunders and voices and an earthquake. And you've got the city of Jerusalem dividing in three parts. You've got Babylon coming under judgment. You find the islands fleeing away. There are tsunamis all over the world that are being swamped by gigantic waves that are cresting over the tops of them. The mountains were not found. You find another of the plagues here in verse 21. There fell upon men a great hail out of heaven about every weight about a talent. You know what that is? That is a hailstone that weighs 120 pounds. Nobody has ever seen hailstones that big. All over the earth, God is pounding it with hailstones that weigh 120 pounds. And men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. You get to chapter 17, that's religious Babylon is destroyed. Chapter 18, political and economic Babylon is destroyed. Chapter 19, the second coming at the end of the tribulation. We mentioned Melchizedek a moment ago. I'll just read you a couple of verses about that. Speaking of Christ very clearly, Hebrews 6.20. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then it tells you about Melchizedek. He's a theophany. He's not a type. He's a theophany. Because listen to his, his description. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem. Salem is the ancient name for the city of Jerusalem. Who is the king of Jerusalem? Priest of the Most High God, El Elyon. Where that's found in the book of Genesis. Where Melchizedek comes out to meet Abraham. That's the first time that that name, El Elyon, the Most High God, is used in Scripture. Who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. To whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation. So now he's going to tell you who Melchizedek is. Melech Sedek. Melech is king. Sedek is righteousness. Melchizedek, first being by interpretation, king of righteousness. Who is the king of righteousness, according to the book of Isaiah? It's Jesus. And after that also, king of Salem, which is king of peace. Who is the king of peace? Now he tells you something about him. He's without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Who do you know like that? And then it says, but made like. And people say, oh, well, that means that he's just a type. No, that is a word that means his visual appearance was of the Son of God. 
He abides a priest continually. In other words, he's still a priest. And then he goes on and he tells you something more about Melchizedek. He says, consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who received the office of priesthood, that is Levitical priesthood, that is the Aaronic priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they came out of the loins of Abraham. In other words, remember, here's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then we have Levi. And from Levi come all the Levites, and one of them is Aaron, who becomes the high priest and the head of the Aaronic priesthood. So you've got four generations up here before you get to Levi. Isaac wasn't even born when Abraham paid the tithes. So the writer of Hebrews, this is what's called the doctrine of federal headship for those of you who are into theology. Levi was still in the loins of his father Abraham. Four generations back, your descendants are seen in you. However many generations that will be, your descendants are seen in you. That's what he's telling you here. It says, those who came out of the loins of Abraham, but he whose descent is not counted from them, that is, this one who showed up, received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Look at verse 7. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. In other words, Melchizedek blessed Abraham, which means that Melchizedek was greater than Abraham, because the less is blessed of the better. Do you understand? You say, but wait a minute, Jesus was a descendant of Abraham, and yes, but Jesus was also the God of Abraham. And the less is blessed of the better. We get down to verse 17. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, speaking of Christ. We get down to verse 21. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Takes you back to Psalm 110, which you read, where the Lord has sworn and will not repent to the Messiah. Dear people, the scripture is so rich. It is so full, if we'll but read it. And God has woven it together like a beautiful tapestry with the gold and the silver shining out. And as you stand back and look at the entire thing, it gives you the picture of Jesus. The plague of death is also the Passover of salvation. Ah, oh, that we might learn it. I wish we had time to read all of that passage in Hebrews, but back to our text. Exodus chapter 11, now verse 5, which is not really our text, and I think we're already past time again. I can't believe we haven't even gotten into chapter 12. Well, this is stuff from last week that we didn't cover. So here we go, back to the text, verse 5. And all the firstborn of the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth on his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not none like it, nor shall be like it any more. Verse 7. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue. Now, you know, dogs are pretty hard to control when they want to start barking when exciting things are going on. There were some exciting things going on that night as the children of Israel got up and left in the middle of the night. They ate the Passover in haste. Their feet were already shod with their shoes. They already had girded up their, their sashes around them. They had their bags packed. They were ready to move out as soon as they finished dinner. You know, and if you had a huge mob like that, several million people getting up and moving out through the night, do you not think that there would be one dog bark? God said, not one of the Egyptians is going to say a thing about it. They're not going to try to stop you. Not one. Not even a dog is going to bark against you. 
And look at the last phrase. That you may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Dear people, we're not different because we want to be different. We're different because God puts a difference between us and the world around us. That's why we don't think the same. That's why we don't dress the same. That's why we don't do the same. As all the world around us who are dead in trespasses and sins, that is why we are different. Is because the Lord has put a difference between his people and the world. And yet, how many Christians are trying to be like the world? How many have gone back to the seeker-friendly church mode, gone back to the rock music and the, the flashing strobe lights on the stage and the wiggling bodies and the half-naked bodies and the loud guitars where they're strumming it out? And You know, there's a Christian college coming up that's going to be doing a winter fest like that. Burns my heart to see that. A bunch of Christian colleges doing that. They've got to be like the world. Got to be like the world. What does this say? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Be ye separate. It's not man's idea. It's God's idea. It goes all the way back to the book of Exodus. The Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. I'll close with the next verse. So much more we could add here. Verse 8. And all these thy servants shall come down unto me and bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out, and all the people that follow thee. Do you see what he calls the Egyptians? For 400 years, Israel had lived in Egypt, and they'd been sort of after the days of Joseph, second-class citizens. And during the last part of that 400 years, they had been slaves to the Egyptians. God says, I've just pulled a wrestling maneuver. I've pulled what's called a reversal. You are the servants. Now the Egyptians are your servants. Your servants are going to come and beg you to get out. You see, there is a winner in every contest. With God, there are no ties. And no matter how badly the world may treat his people, there is a winner in the end. And it is the sovereign God of the Bible who has foreordained all things that come to pass. He is the God who is the victor. He is the God who is the king. He is the one who allows us to go through those times of testing to purify us and to cleanse us from the sin that lives in the lives of Christians. But in the end, he is the winner. And in the end, he gets the glory over all the gods of Egypt. That all men might know that he is the Lord. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you are indeed the Lord. There is so much that ties your word together from beginning to end. So many references in the prophets of the Old Testament pointing Israel back to this day of deliverance. So many references in the New Testament telling us that this was a picture and a type, that Christ, our Passover, is crucified for us. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Passover Lamb. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Father, how we thank you that as with Abraham, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. And on Calvary, God provided himself a lamb for the burnt offering. 
Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Father, we pray that you'll take your word and use it powerfully in our hearts to the glory of Jesus Christ, the Lamb who reigns in heaven, the Lamb before whom we will cast our crowns someday and cry with the multitudes of the ages, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain and hath redeemed us unto God by his blood to receive riches and honor and power and glory and blessing. The Lamb who is worthy to be praised. We pray it in his name, in the name of Jesus our Savior, the Lamb of God. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 6.